Good morning, church family and friends, and welcome to our virtual service, still physically distancing and still connecting. We are the Buckman Bridge Unitarian Universalist Church, or as we say, BBUUC. This welcoming church is radically inclusive, passionately supportive of social justice, and affirming of wherever you are on your own spiritual journey. We'll continue to hold services virtually on this YouTube channel until we're able to safely meet in our sanctuary again. In addition, we have adapted other ways to connect during these times. Our platform includes classes, small group ministries, children's chapel, parenting groups, and coffee groups. Lots of ways to connect. Please check out our Facebook page and the church website for specific information. People who come from all faith traditions and no faith are welcome here. We come together on this path because we have a shared set of principles, but not the same single concept of the sacred. We recognize the sacredness of many names and a mystery beyond all our naming. You'll find those values on the church website, bbuuc.org, or on the denominational website, uua.org. Here, we each find our own path to living out those principles with the others in our church family who are on the journey with us. Again, you are all welcome here. Our opening words today were written by the author, Stephen King. Yes, that Stephen King. We did not ask for this room or this music. We were invited in. Therefore, because the dark surrounds us, let us turn our faces toward the light. Let us endure hardship to be grateful for plenty. We did not ask for this room or this music, but because we are here, let us dance. I would like to invite our member, Sandy Goldman, to begin with the chalice lighting prayer. We light our chalice to remind us that light overtakes darkness, good triumphs over evil, knowledge replaces ignorance, hope prevails over despair, justice conquers bias, and generosity overcomes greed. The light shines on us and in us. We pass this light on to others because the values we live are the light of the world. Good morning. I am so happy to be with you here today. I wonder what's in the wonder box. Do you have a guess? <laughs> it is my favorite UU t-shirt. Can you see that it's a chalice with the Wonder Woman symbol? And the UUs right there, yeah. And the flame, it's one of my favorite shirts. Every day, you and I must make a decision about what we're gonna wear. And for a lot of folks, the clothing that they wear is really important. People use clothing styles to help define who they are, who they want to be. Sometimes I see people wearing t-shirts that have Minecraft or adventure characters or cute kittens. I wonder what your favorite t-shirt is. When I see people wearing the t-shirts, I think, oh, they must like gaming or the Marvel Universe or cute animals. And I've learned a little bit about the person wearing the shirt based on what they're, they chose to wear. What we choose to wear can be a form of nonverbal communication, a way to share about ourselves without having to say anything. If I'm wearing my favorite UU t-shirt, I'm letting people know that I'm proud of my UU faith. In the Bible, there's a passage in Paul's letter to the Colossians where he teaches that as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, 
for us to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, to forgive one another for things that have upset us, and over all of these virtues to put on love, which binds everything else together in perfect unity. As Unitarian Universalist, our fourth source calls us to respond to God, to respond to God's love as found in our Jewish and Christian teachings by loving our neighbors as ourselves. What if when you make the decision of what to wear today and every day, you also thought about putting on kindness, gentleness, patience? What if we put on a forgiving attitude? and topped it all off by putting on love. That brings it all together in perfect unity. The great thing about this outfit is it never goes out of style and it fits everyone. See, it doesn't matter if you're wearing the most expensive, coolest and most popular thing ever made. If you first do not clothe yourself in an attitude of love. I wonder what decisions you will make about what to clothe yourself in. And with that, my story is told. Till next time. As a church community, we take time to hold our members in our thoughts as we reflect on the joys and concerns they have chosen to share with us. As with any family, we are deepened by sharing milestones and celebrations, and also by sharing what weighs on our hearts. Relationships continue to be built. We draw closer together, regardless of temporary distance. The heart knows no distance, and we are stronger together. A candle of sympathy for Terry M. and Howard M. at the death of Terry's son, Brian. A candle of concern and love for Reverend Lizzie T., who is back at home after a serious cancer diagnosis. Calls and texts are discouraged. However, cards and notes are welcome. A candle of concern for Anne Marie S.'s sister, who has been placed in hospice care please reach out to her with your support. And a candle of continued concern for the current unrest and the health crisis in our country. And a candle of hope for change and recovery. A candle of joy for symbols of oppression being removed from public spaces in Jacksonville. A candle of joy and celebration for two wedding anniversaries in our congregation on June the 18th. Ben and Meg A, and Kent and Portia H. A candle of joy for Joyce J, who celebrates her birthday on June 15th, and another birthday candle of joy for Leslie S, whose special day is June 18th. And a final candle for those unspoken joys and concerns that remain in our hearts. Now, please enjoy the song the Rich Man, The Camel, and The Eye of the Needle, written and performed by our member, Job Myler. It's the relentless pursuit of self-accommodation that keeps most people hanging on With all I seek and all I know Leads me to think they might be wrong What can I do for me today? Seems to be the common thing But it's what they mean 
It's the relentless pursuit of self-accommodation that keeps most people driving on. With all I seek and all I know leads me to think they might be wrong. Millions live without food and shelter. Without clean water, many people die. We feed our lawns with water clean enough to drink, while our dogs sleep warm and dry. It's the relentless pursuit of self accommodation that keeps most people pushing on. With all I see, and all I know leads me to think they might be wrong. I lost my religion, still trying to get it back. It's contradictory to me. The rich man, the camel, and the eye of the knee. It seems that's all they want to be Yeah, that's all they want to be A rich man is all they want to be It's the relentless pursuit of self-accommodation That keeps most people pushing on With all I seek and all I know Might be wrong. My favorite phrase is what would Jesus do? I think he'd help a brother out. Wouldn't think he'd live in some gated neighborhood when it's holding in is worse than what it's keeping out. Yeah, what it's holding in is worse than what it's keeping out. Say, what it's holding in is worse than what it's keeping out. It's the relentless pursuit of self accommodation that keeps most people driving on. With all I seek and all I know. Think they might be wrong. Yeah, I think they might be wrong. Yeah, I'd say they're probably wrong. We are still a church no matter where or how we meet. It is not simply a church building. The church is each of us who make up the members and friends of this congregation. We continue to explore new ways to connect, to love, to serve, and to be with one another. During this time of uncertainty, we stay grounded in the one thing of which we are certain, our mission. We remain focused on maintaining our ministry, our building, grounds, staff, and our shared values. We can't pass the plate in person. However, we will gratefully accept your virtual offering. First, thank you for your ongoing pledge commitment, which supports this self-supporting church. And for the month of June, the plate donations will be contributed to BLUU, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. BLUU is an independent organization financially sponsored by the UUA, led by an executive director, a community minister, and a volunteer organizing collective, which provides ministry for and by Black Unitarian Universalists, while also working to expand the role and visibility of Black UUs within our faith. To make an offering, Simply go to the link on our PayPal giving fund on our YouTube channel 
and give any amount, whatever you're able to share. Your contributions are most gratefully appreciated. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Manuel Andrade, Manny as he is known far and wide. He is a life professed Franciscan friar and he joined our church six years ago. Manny, the pulpit is yours. Good morning. For those folks with any connection to the Christian tradition, either as a seeker or someone familiar with the teachings, will probably have heard most of the following phrases. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. Forgive 70 times seven. Whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Feed the hungry. Don't return evil for evil. Visit those in prison. Clothe the naked. House the homeless. Welcome the foreigner. Don't judge. Care for the sick. Love one another as I have loved you. This list of aphorisms is extensive, and there are more, and I'm sure you're thinking of one yourself, you know, oh, you forgot this one. And that's okay, because what we're talking about is not necessarily listing all of these things, but getting down to the essence of what it means and the significance of the faith that draws you to say these things, to come up with these ideas. So we're going to explore that today. We're also going to be looking at um, some developments in the last 50 years that um, kind of challenge us in a way that is pulling some people away from these ideas, but we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Now, I share with uh, Franciscan Friar Richard Rohr that Christianity is a lifestyle a way of being in the world that is simple, nonviolent, shared, and loving. But if we look back at history, if we go back to the foundation of Christianity as a religion of the state by Constantine, when it was established as part of the state, Christianity, that lifestyle, changed it became less of a personal experience. It became less of a tool of discernment for spiritual growth. And it became focused more on externals, meaning that the internal process that challenges us uh, to grow in compassion and faith was superseded by rules. Here's a good example. Today, you're told that your duty is to tithe. You write, you submit your check, good 10% of everything. But what happens to the thought process? I, I just wrote a check and I turned it in. You send it in, but are you looking around and not seeing what is around you? You're considered a good Christian. You pat yourself on the back and you go on about your busy life. However, as a per there's a person that lives less than a mile from your house who is choosing survival sex work to feed her children. Lately, we've seen situations where mostly young men, African-American young men, who were murdered and gunned down for no reason other than the amount of melanin on their skin. And we say, how awful, this is terrible, this should not be. And then we change the channel to see what Meredith Gray is doing this week. It's our nature. It's easy to fall into that. And that's the challenge that Christianity gives us to look at that and try to examine oh wait a minute this is incongruent with my aspirations to the, what I hope to be as a person 
the inner work, the discernment process that we're called to do, brings us to examine the interconnectedness of all things. Think of nature, people, situations. And this is the foundation both for Christianity and for our UU faith. We see fires raging in Australia and the Amazon. The Amazon are the very lungs of the planet that we live on and they're being destroyed. Oh, it's too depressing. Let's talk about something else. The challenging work of discernment that makes a Christian a follower of a ragtag bunch of men and women who are descendants of former desert nomads who are coming out of the Bronze Age in the Middle East and their successors of over two millennia is what gives meaning to the Christian message, discernment processing, integrating my ideas with my actions, my thought with my heart, my aspirations where I want to be. In a beautiful letter by Paul, the great author, um, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves in compassion, kindness, and patience. Whew. Okay, I'll work on it. And that's it. That's Christianity. I'll work on it. However, in the last 40 to 50 years, we've seen some unexpected changes in how Christianity is viewed, how the Christian message is, is processed and absorbed. And it comes in, in extremes. One is liberation theology, which came out of the slums of Latin America and looks at the gospel from the eyes of the poor. A friend of mine, an Episcopal bishop, um, Antonio Ramos, said to me, who had done a lot of work in Latin America, said, you know, when people in, think of Holy Week in Latin America, they think of Good Friday. In the U.S., Good Friday is minimized, and it's Easter. That's the big holiday. The poor associate with the suffering, and the wealthier folks with perhaps some of the joys and the gifts. The other side is something that's called the Gospel of Prosperity, which is a mixture of the Pentecostal tradition, New Thought, the group of people that worked on the power of positive thinking. It also has American pragmatism, individualism, and a good dash of upward mobility. looking at extremes. It's a, we're living in a time where Christianity um, is really going far beyond where it has been traditionally and really exploring different areas. And I want to look at some of the history that led to this gospel of prosperity. Um, and I'll be frank with you, it's quite in contrast with the faith that I've grown to love and understand and, and the message of progressive Christianity and the teachings of the prophet Jesus. One example is that in 1947, Oral Roberts stated that faith is a blessing pact in which God would return your donation sevenfold. Hmm. In 1968, till evangelism supplanted tent and other revivals for the most part and gained a wider audience. In 2000, televangelism had reached a significant part of the third world. And in 2006, a Time magazine poll found that 17% of Americans identified with the movement. It's almost 2 out of 10. 
At the inauguration of the 45th president, prayers were said by two prosperity gospel preachers, and the invocation was given by the president's personal spiritual advisor, Paula White. And she has been known to say from the pulpit in an appeal to her followers, if you don't send the money, you'll never see sustainment in your life. Your dream will die. She also quoted varying amounts of, uh, of cash that I choose not to share. How do progressive Christians see this development? How do you compare the basic understanding of Christian faith faced with this phenomenon? You know that the prophet Jesus devoted 25% of his words in the gospel about money. That's 28 passages, which is more than heaven and hell combined. But his take, based on my understanding and my readings, is that prosperity is not about objects. It's not an object. Prosperity is a character. Meaning, when we say blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, there was no money involved. He was speaking about developing your faith and your character and understanding the role of spirit in your life through which we see others in our community. This is everything to do with who we are and not what we have. This is about how much we roll up our sleeves to address the lives and situations of those around us. In addition, we must learn to acknowledge our own wealth, both in our spirituality and in our values. I'll give you an example. One out of four people globally, and that would be around 1.9 billion good people, are moderately or severely food insecure. 820 million don't have enough food to eat. Let's place ourselves next to one of these one out of four people. One out of the four hungry. Stand next to them. Someone whose lives is a series of struggles Aren't we very rich? The faith is about not judgment. There's a passage that's very seldom spoken of, which is really significant to me. Jesus told a woman, now she'd had five husbands and was living with a man she wasn't married to. He sent her out to spread the good news because spreading love will save people. Judging them clearly can't. It wasn't about wagging your finger and saying, well, our law says this and you really should do that. Is He saw the value in this person, saw her gifts, recognized them, recognized her priesthood and sent her to do the work. The Christ mystery is much, much bigger than Christianity as an organized religion, especially in this time of searching and, and, and wading through such diversity in the faith. Meaning, if we place ourselves to look at this planet with the eyes of a child, with a sense of wonder, and with pure hearts, we will find that we are capable of lasting goodness. We will certainly be capable of building bridges, making friends, and come to understand and respect other religions, and respect the planet itself. Jesus' message was not to create a country club or a tribe of people who would easily say that we are in and you're out. This is not fashion. 
More importantly, he didn't create a club or a tribe where people say, we have truth and you don't. The magic of the teachings of Jesus is that he revealed there is something that is true everywhere, for everyone, and for all time. It's to clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, gentleness, and patience. Amen. Extinguish the chalice, I invite you to listen to this adaptation of a Franciscan benediction. May you have an abundance of discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deeply within your heart. May you have a bounty of anger at injustice oppression and exploitation of people so you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May you be rich with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may you have a generous supply of recklessness to believe you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Bring justice and kindness to all our brothers and sisters. When you have these, you will know prosperity beyond measure. Our worship time has ended. Now, let your service begin. May it be so. Go in peace.